Good evening. Uh, once again, uh, we're brought together here for an opportunity to discuss the direction that this nation is moving towards. My name is Mark, I'm from Michigan, and we'll be covering uh, all aspects or everything that we possibly can concerning the new world order operations inside the United States. We'll be discussing the MJTF police, FinCEN, United Nations Combat Forces inside the United States, and the conversion of the United States into an asset for the United Nations. To begin with, I originally worked as an intelligence analyst in 1975 through 1981, first with USAIX, the Company D out of, out of USAIX, Fort Chuuk, Arizona. From there, moved on to 5th U.S. Army Intelligence Center, where I worked both as an intelligence analyst and as a uh, counterintelligence coordinator. Later through the 80s, up until present time, I command two, uh, both 2nd and 3rd Op 4 brigades, which are special warfare units that train uh, U.S. military forces in foreign warfare and tactics. Uh, we're going to start out with the MJTF police and where it came from, what its, what its original mission was, what its mission is now. Through a series of political actions that started around approximately March of 1989, the federal government uh, extorted uh, resources from most of the states, in fact all 50 states simultaneously, within a two-week period, passing laws in every state authorizing the use of federal funding to convert local and state forces into national police forces. The MJTF Police Multi-Jurisdictional Task Force is in virtually every state of the Union of the United States at this time. Its primary mission is house-to-house -house search and seizure, separation and categorization of men, women, and children in large numbers, the transfer to detention facilities, and the use of those facilities for interrogation purposes. The MJTF is our regular National Guard, uh, local law enforcement, and street gangs converted to National Police Services. Remember that this was originally organized under uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. We all know, of course, now that uh, President Clinton has proposed a National Police Force. This is simply another name, in fact, an overt name for the MJTF Police. Now, the motto for the MJTF police is that they are the velvet glove on the iron fist. Anybody who's familiar with some of the speeches that have taken place, uh, ex-President Reagan spoke in England here approximately two months ago and commented that the United Nations forces would be the velvet glove on the steel fist. This is a very popular phrase. It has been used extensively by these people that are within the New World Order operation. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, any time I've been hit with an iron fist, I usually don't feel too good, and a velvet glove doesn't make much difference. Uh, it should be noted that most of the resources are being drawn from, again, federal funding to our regional governments. The state of Michigan uh, converted part of their forces over on February 11th of 1989 when uh, Senator Carl Levin, the state sergeant generals of the state of Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana met in Lansing and at 6.35 in the evening an agreement was struck in which elements of the Michigan National Guard would be deployed in Indiana and Ohio in the event of, and in fact it was, not, it was stated that when firearms are confiscated in the Midwest, that these forces would be deployed both in Indiana and in Ohio. Indiana and Ohio would then provide 50% of its guard forces to police the Michigan area under the MJTF police guidelines. Approximately three months after the agree arrangement was made uh, through the Department of Defense in conjunction with other agencies, some of them unknown at this time, uh, the state of Indiana backed out of the agreement. When this took place, uh, the federal government, through a series of funding coordinations, drew withdrew resources from the state of Indiana. They had to restructure part of their guard mechanism, and in the process, uh, were able to maintain a good portion of their original integrity concerning their preparedness strength for, for guard forces. Uh, the three battalions had to be restructured at that time. Now, the MJTF police are supplied and supported through strategic uh, reserve aircraft that have been transferred to their resource. Uh, they will convert almost all of the existing uh, local police agencies to national police forces after they've rifted personnel that they do not consider trustworthy. And they will also incorporate street gangs. Now, if anybody has seen the guidelines, and we have copies of both, 
Uh, the original stated that house-to-house -house search and seizures would be performed by military, law enforcement, and civilian personnel. Now, we all know who the military are. That's anybody in a green uniform or a blue uniform with the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. We understand that those would be people in the National Guard, Reserve, and active, our active military forces. We know who law enforcement is. These are the constables, the individuals that you have at your local level, all the way up to and including our secret police in the United States, such as the FBI, Central Intelligence Agency, and other agencies that might be at their disposal, Defense Intelligence Agency, etc. Who are the civilians that were going to come into your home? I don't recall there being any guidelines for that in the Constitution. Uh, if anybody was, has listened to national public radio, you will note that on several different occasions, uh, specifically the 10th month of 1992, it was announced, and in fact, there was a one-hour special program on uh, national public radio about converting the street gangs to law enforcement agencies. We had been talking about this for years prior to its action. We knew that there were preparatory activities taking place. But through these activities, a truce was signed by most of the large gangs in the city of Los Angeles. At the time, there were negotiations in process in Chicago, and this was also taking place in New York. Since the initial action, a full agreement has been signed in Los Angeles, and both the Crips and the Bloods are now being trained, equipped, and uniformed by, with federal funding through California. Chicago has finalized this agreement last week. New York is in the process of doing so sometimes in the next few weeks, and we can assume that they will do this very quickly. These forces will be the cannon fodder, the Schutzenauptelung. Their mission is to be the forefront, the master forces to come through the door. Remember that the average federal agent makes anywhere from forty-seven dollars to $57,000 a year. He's more or less looking at his pension. He's not concerned with risking his life, especially if he can find someone to throw in front of him as a sandbag. That's the mission of these root forces that are being organized. Um, since last I spoke, uh, probably the best example, I'm sure that everybody uh, listening here has uh, heard about Waco, Texas. These forces that were on the ground, to give you the best example, were not effective fighting forces. When you retreat and leave wounded and dead lying on the ground, that's called a rout. That's not a retreat. And this is symptomatic of professional forces that are there for the money. On the other hand, if you use the old medieval pillage principle and you have a profit mechanism set up in which you are allowed to confiscate properties, cars, jewelry, furniture, the neighbor's wife, whatever, then you're highly motivated to go through that door. And especially if you've been doing it illegally for an extensive period of time, and all of a sudden are given the opportunity to be legitimized. Remember, why let the street gang situation foster or flourish the way it did? We had more than the capability to restrict the, to restrict the street gangs at the time when they came about. Most assuredly, we had the, the capacity to restrict them in, in any way that we wished to. However, by allowing the street gangs to flourish, you create regimentation. Then, the strong come to the top. These are your NCOs and leaders. And when you are finished, you simply put them in uniform and you have an organized military force at your disposal. They're thugs, but they're expendable thugs. Remember that. Now, MJTF police operations are, uh, there are several actions that have taken place within the last two years. Uh, starting in 1991, they participated or were part of Operation Achilles, which was a sweep from the southern Ohio Valley up through to Michigan of ATF uh, by the, both the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and, ATF and MJTF forces to harass and eliminate uh, FFL holders who were manufacturers and producers of components and arms. Their primary concern was not to confiscate or charge somebody with illegal arms, but rather to acquire records and resources that were available and in the hands of the people who, who held the FFL. In every case where they went into these businesses, the only thing that they took were the records of who purchased products and where they lived. Very important to understand. Now there's a, there are a series of other activities that took place after this. MJTF was, was deployed in Los Angeles during the LA riots. Though there was only a slight mention of it, that's the authority that they were under, along with FinCEN. All of these agencies are overlapping and under the general authority of the United Nations. Remember, we are now an international organization, not the United States. 
because we're a small corporate entity, part of a big company, larger, larger company. In 1992 through uh, early 1993, uh, reorganization was taking place to try and give the MJTF greater credibility. However, it was understood that their mercenary forces probably will not function as originally anticipated, so the Guard has been restructured. That, for many people who are familiar with the way the Guard operates, will, will be able to understand why the Guard is being rifted of experienced personnel. Desert Dust, or in other words, we call it Desert Storm, its primary mission, it was threefold, but its primary mission was to see whether or not the American people would eat the New World Order. U.S. soldiers were sent overseas, their American flags were taken off their uniforms, flags were taken down by officers in the field because the flag was not to be flown. Most every other nationality was allowed to fly their flag, and other than for publicity purposes for public consumption, the general position was that the flag was to be, was to be trodden at every opportunity. However, if any of you were watching the news, you'll notice a lot of Marines were jumping up and showing their patch, which they just pulled out of their pocket and putting it, laying it on their arm and going, see this? This is what I'm fighting for. These people have to be done away with. You can't have these people in the military. And so they decided that they would have to rift these people out, transfer them to the Guard. If they're already in Guard units, uh, restructure, reestablish guidelines that would allow them to extract these people from the mechanism. They're trying to go to the next generation of educated idiots. They're looking for people who are going to be more pliable, as Mr. Rockefeller said many years ago, clay that can be molded more efficiently. And since the first or latest crop didn't work, we're now going to restructure the entire mechanism and see what we can get from the next batch. This is where we're going with this. Now, it should be noted that before they can do all of this, before they can perform any of the actions that are, that are pending, they are going to have to take the weapons that we have inside the United States. I will say again that the meeting that took place in 1989, the federal government and the representatives that were there stated uncategorically when we take the weapons, not if we take the weapons, but when. And under, those, under that premise, everything else was constructed. Now. Very quickly, there's one that I like here, and I'm going to have it put up on the board while we're, while we're speaking. A little poster everybody should remember. All of those in favor of gun control, raise your right hand. Um, there's an interesting piece that just came out that I was most fascinated with with regards to firearms laws. Uh, it's a book you know, concerning the Gun Control Act of 1968, in which it has been demonstrated that the Gun Control Act of 1968 wasn't simply an American creation. It was taken from Nazi Germany's gun control laws of 1938, word for word. Now that's very important when you consider this because we're not talking a few paragraphs here and there. The entire document is taken from Nazi Germany's gun control laws of 1938. If they're already at that level in 1968, then where are you going to go with our gun laws now? If you've listened to the people who are talking about this, they say that the Brady Bill, for instance, and I'm, I'm hoping everybody understands what that is, that's one of the pending firearms legislations that's at the state and at the uh, Senate and uh, House level right now. It is a good first step to follow through on this. I don't think anybody likes that idea. Uh, if that's a first step, then where are we headed? It should be understood that uh, the MJTF police is not trusted by the federal agencies and eventually will be done away with. Again, the MJTF are useful cannon fodder that eventually will be swept to the side. Moving on beyond the MJTF police, and we're going to back up into them a little bit, are FinCEN forces. FinCEN are Financial Crimes Enforcement, are Enforcement Network personnel. FinCEN has as much to do with finances as the SAS had to do with, the, with airplanes. The SAS Special Air Service was a cover name for an entity which existed in England and was the equivalent to the OSS of, 19, uh, of World War II, 1941 through 1945. FinCEN forces, uh, are their mission is house-to-house -house search and seizure, separation and categorization of men, women, and children, transfer to detention facilities, securing uh, properties acquired, but not the maintaining of detention camps. That will be the mission of the MJTF police. I should mention very quickly, the detention camps themselves. Originally under FEMA, 23 detention camps were authorized. These detention camps were spread out across the United States. 
In addition to that, there are 20 supplemental camps that were authorized with the 1989, 19, or I'm sorry, 1990-1991 military fiscal budget. Uh, Carl Levin's DOD budget amendment 656 authorized the implementation of these 20 camps to supplement the 23 that were already authorized. There are now 43 total camps that are pre-deployed inside the continental United States. In addition to that, there are supplemental camps or auxiliary camps through each state and in each region. An example of this would be the Nike Hercules site located near Monroe. That is, that is a pre-designated detention facility. The three sites that are located in Michigan, number one, is located due north, of Pick, uh, due, due north of Pickney, Michigan, due west of Brighton. The second is, is earmarked near Lansing, Michigan, to the north-northeast. The third is Fort Custer Military Reservation, which has been upgraded from a D facility to a B facility. This is very important because a D facility is state authorized and state controlled. A B facility, on the other hand, has been upgraded to federal status and is comparable to any of our, for instance, uh, prime military facilities such as Fort Benning, Georgia, um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, any facility that we're presently using for active military forces. However, if you get a chance to uh, tour the highways and byways and back roads of Fort Custer, you'll find that there's a new urban warfare center there. The new urban warfare center doesn't look like bad Hirschfeld, Germany. It looks like downtown Monroe. It looks like downtown Saline. It has three-bedroom ranch-style houses, cracker box farmhouses, small living areas inside downtown areas. At this particular site, uh, MJTF police forces were training from the first week of uh, January of 1989 on. They were training every second and third week of the month from uh, Monday through Thursday. They were paying with non-DOD funds, in other words, either GSA funds or they were funds from another agency other than regular military budget allocations. It's important to understand how they pay because that's how you can find out who it is that's playing. Now, these forces operated secretly for a number, of, a number of months, and we identified them as they were training, and they changed facilities. Uh, we understand after approximately a year and a half cooling time that they are using Custer, and they are using Grayling again extensively, bringing forces together from other parts of the state, training them on site, and then sending them back out to be prepared for whatever is going to happen in the future. We'll get back to FinCEN now. FinCEN was organized utilizing foreign military forces as secret police agencies here, or as secret police forces here in the United States. They are drawn from military and secret, secret police forces overseas. They are predominantly European. We have Belgian, Dutch, German. We're looking at French. We also have a variety of Asian military personnel. It is known at this time, for instance, that FinCEN has an element in Montana that is made up of Gurkhas. The 197th mechanized, as of one month ago, or I'm sorry, excuse me, as of one week ago, has deployed for a training operation that may last as long as two months in northern Montana through to the Canadian frontier. It is the 197th mechanized infantry combined with two brigades of, of British mechanized infantry, the 1st Canadian Armored Division, Gurkha mercenary forces, one Belgian brigade, one EEC mixed security brigade, and an undetermined number of other forces, all foreign. They, will, they originally were scheduled to work for approximately three weeks in the area, but if this is similar to the last mobilization that took place, you will find that they will be there for up to two and a half, three months. During the LA uh, crisis that took place, there were a series of actions that took place both in Montana, we also saw activities in California, and there were activities in northern Texas in the Panhandle. Vincent forces are ruthless. An example, the Gurkhas are professional mercenary forces from Nepal. They rotate these forces for a period of time out of Nepal and were originally hired by the British military force for a number of years. Uh, now that they're under UN authority, of course, uh, we have to find a use for them, and they have. Remember, the Gurkhas uh, were being paid by the British and probably still are to be used against us, kind of like the Hessians of 1775, isn't it? I think you'll find a lot of other forces with similar perspective there. There are, and I will use the regional map here, there are a number of forces spread throughout the 10 regions. For those of you who are not familiar with regionalism, regionalism is a uh, 
form of government that we're about to experience if the uh, New World Order people have their way. Under regionalism, Michigan becomes not Michigan, but Area 5. As Area 5, our capital will be in Chicago. Under the new state's constitution, this particular uh, type of government comes into power. And we're going to find that all of a sudden we're going to be part of this warm, fuzzy New World Order real quick. Unfortunately, we never vote for a governor again. The governor will be directly assigned by the president, kind of like in Star Wars. Uh, if you remember, uh, it was rather entertaining. Uh, Grand Moff Tarkin comes into the briefing room and goes, uh, the emperor has just done away with the Senate. And of course, some one of the admirals goes, how will he manage without the bureaucracy? And the uh, Grand Moff turns and goes, and decides to go, uh, well, uh, our regional governor shall deal with the problem. Terror shall reign. And most assuredly, terror shall reign. The regional governor will not have the same authority over his military forces, but he most assuredly will have uh, full authority over his security forces. Unlike the governors of old who had a pocket army, he will simply have police. The centralized military force will be completely under the authority of the United Nations. Now, how did we get here? Well, that's an interesting story when you think about it because there are a lot of problems that are involved. It's an ongoing escalation of resources pitted against the American people and the Republic. We are a constitutional Republic, by the way. We're not a democracy. I think everybody better remember that right now. This is a problem you run into even with Republican presidents. How many times did we hear George Bush say, this democracy, this is a man who calls himself a Republican. I'm not necessarily a Republican or a Democrat. I'm one of those independent American kind of guys. Um, an example of FinCEN and some of the effects that uh, overlap into the United Nations operations, this was on the cover of Airman Magazine, uh, which is the U.S. Air Force publication, July 1992. It should be very evident that the forces that, you're, that are displayed here on the cover are very impressive. Unfortunately, of the five aircraft on the cover, only one of them is American. The rest are all Soviet bombers or Soviet heavy lift aircraft. It should be noted that uh, these types of assets have been reported on for the last 10 years by a lot of people in the military who people simply didn't want to listen to or believe. These are, documented, or document, uh, these are documents that, uh, shall we say, more than verify the validity of comments that were made in the past. The forces involved that we're going to see in FinCEN uh, will be very well educated. They are professional military forces. They are, for all practical purposes, mercenaries, of course. Uh, you're going to find that they normally serve an eight-year tour, unlike the old American mechanism, which was a six-year tour, mixed type of both act, a mixed time of active and reserve component with IRR, independent ready reserve options. Instead, we've now gone to an eight-year mechanism, the same as all foreign professional forces overseas, very characteristic of the same mechanism that the British used against us in 1775. Conscription through uh, pressing was normally done with an eight-year tour. There are a variety of different mechanisms that I'd like to also include. The black hole if we allow this to exist. It should be noted that these people are chugging on no matter or despite the types of pitfalls we've thrown in front of them. We will slow them down we probably will not stop them completely, and this will become an armed confrontation. I cannot believe that the American people are going to continue to participate in something like this without, not, without realizing eventually that somebody's selling the cookie jar. They aren't just grabbing the cookies. Otherwise, what we're looking at right now, uh, I have two or three other pieces that I'd like to throw in here, but what we're looking at right now is an action which is quite sophisticated, has taken probably 50 years to develop, and the enemy has almost reached that point where he can touch the golden ring. Imagine, if you will, going around the merry-go-round and almost having your hand on it. It's in slow motion, time dilation. All of their different schemes, plotting and connivings have come to a nexus, a point in time at which they have the opportunity to grab everything. To do this, they must act quickly. They have windows of opportunity. They are very dangerous at this particular point because there is an old story, the swift stroke oft misses. That's the problem with this. If we're lucky, we can get them to move quickly or move too quickly. They will show too much, and the American people are not complete dummies. And there are enough of us, there are enough patriots out there that are interested in, survive, in seeing the Constitution and the Bill of Rights survive. 
that they will participate in the defense of the nation. There are a lot of military forces that are being sent overseas. Doesn't anybody wonder while in this time of peace we're sending more and more of our military strength to Bosnia-Herzegovina, Somalia, Thailand, and has anybody heard about our forces in Peru? I imagine not. Well, I'll give you a good example. We have 20 to 21,000 personnel right now sitting off Yugoslavia's coast or in Yugoslavia at this time. We have approximately 20,000 mixed personnel functioning in Somalia. Now that's 40,000 40, uh, combat personnel. In addition to that, we have 22 to 23,000 in Cambodia. Now we've got 60,000 people overseas. Most of them are combat troops. Let's go one step farther. Back during Desert Dust, one of those little actions that was missed by everybody is that during executive orders that were signed, 18,000 US military personnel were sent to Peru for policing operations there under UN authority. Now, this is documented. We've got people who are down there right now. There are families and there are mothers that are highly concerned about the people that are in place. They have lost people there. People have been killed. This receives no publicity, and yet it's, yet it's going on. It's a prime example of uh, watch my right hand, watch my, watch my right hand. Hey, <laughs> you didn't see what was going on over here, did you? That's what we have to worry about. These people control the media completely. Uh, what I do a lot of times, and I recommend you do the same thing, is videotape what's going on television, but ignore most of what they say. You know, pay attention to the photographs. If they're really concerned with something, they won't feed you much. But in many cases, they'll feel the general population isn't observant, and there is more in a picture than there is in all of the gobbledygook and words that they've fabricated. You have to ask yourself, when you look at pieces of equipment and activities, why is this taking place? Where is this taking place? Is this actually what's going on? If, if you look at the, the expressions of the individuals, the activities, the uh, attitudes, you know that something doesn't taste right. A lot of military people coming back are tickled pink to leave Somalia fa as fast as they can uh, throw their feet on a 7, uh, 747 or a 737 Airbus. There's a reason for that. It is an untenable situation that is typical of the type that the United Nations has put us into. Of course, by the way, we're paying the bill too. This is not good. It should be noted that a lot of personnel who are overseas, and we have personal contacts that are experiencing this right now, are having dif difficulties bringing family members back or sending family members back from Europe to the United States. We have three families in particular that are experiencing this right now. They're attempting to send their wives and children out of Europe back into the continental United States, and the military will not do it, will not send them. They have not released the dependents, let alone, let alone the husband. This is interesting considering we're not at war and we have no threat of war on the horizon that anybody could, could pick out, short of a few policing actions that are supposed to be fairly minor. I will inject this though. Uh, it used to be we called it the Balkans, not Yugoslavia, and there were a handful of wars there over a period of 50 years that many of your descendants probably left Europe because of. After having three or four of them in a row and losing probably one half or a third of the family, uh, most of the Europeans decided it was time to uh, what we call unass the AO. Excuse me. That was the objective. Now we're calling it Yugoslavia. Right next door are the Muslims. The Muslims are not exactly friendly people to deal with. And given the opportunity and good weapons, they are darn good fighters. Anybody who's in the Korean War knows about the Turks. Those are the people to the east. If they align with the other Muslims, we may have a very interesting experience on our hands. Who will we side with? Well, we'll side with the UN, and they'll side with whoever it is that's against the United States. It's very simple. One of the things I like to incorporate, good old Fred Rexer, a man to remember and a man to admire, be prepared, it's later than you think. And if you don't think so, take a look around you. The, um, the amount of uh, force facing the American people right now is approximately the equivalent to several heavy infantry divisions with a couple of mixed mechanized divisions combined. We're looking at a little over 300,000 personnel that we can verify or that we can at least identify in different parts of the country. These forces include uh, FinCEN elements through Montana, Northern California, Southern California, Central Texas, the northern part of North Carolina, Fort Drum, uh, the Eastern Seaboard, including elements that are now stationed around the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C. There are five uh, FinCEN companies deployed there. I will mention this, that we've put a great deal of heat on these people since we've begun to identify them. And I will ask you something. 
How many people have seen a news clip every night when they watch the media? Somebody takes one of those nice ski masks and put it over their head and busts into somebody's home. 60 Minutes did a little piece on this just the other night, but it's what we've been talking about for a long time. Who's under the ski mask? If you're wearing a ski mask, how do you know who these people are? In fact, how do you know that they're even law enforcement agents? Anybody can wear a uniform, and a ski mask hides the identity, especially when nobody says anything. And even if they do, how would most people be sure? A ski mask, it does for a person at 3 in the afternoon what the KGB did at 12 midnight and 3 in the morning with a knock on the door. It is called terror. And the fact that we would allow that to happen in the United States is a disgrace to our country and a disgrace to our Constitution. I'll tell you one thing right now. When I was in the military, we were, we were trained to shoot people with ski masks on, if you'll recall. We called them terrorists, bank robbers, you know, criminals. Only in this case, I guess now they're hired by the government. It is very important to understand this because we cannot be lackadaisical in understanding the threat. They have progressively, through gradualism, gotten everybody into this mindset that this is an acceptable situation. It is not. It cannot be allowed, it, can be not, it cannot be allowed to continue. If these forces, for instance, are on the up and up, why not bring them into the light? If these people are doing something that's for the good of the nation, why not bring them into the light? Why conceal their activities? Why shroud them in darkness? Why, sh why shroud them in chaos? On the other hand, maybe we want a little chaos. Remember crisis management? Mr. Kissinger brought this up first. Crisis management is a good thing. You're hearing it in the news constantly, aren't we? Crisis management, crisis in Russia, crisis overseas, crisis in New York. We had a bombing, oh my goodness. Uh, with something like this, of course, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. You create the problem, you demonstrate an answer, and you execute the solution. But you created all three. We're looking at the same thing right now here. Now, UN combat forces. I'm going to interject these people real quick because all these people inter interlock and overlap. Uh, United Nations combat forces include those that are cooperating with FinCEN at this time in Montana, the elements that are in California. There were 21,000 of them identified south of Los Angeles and are probably deployed north-northeast of Los Angeles in the Sacramento Basin. The elements that were located in Texas have shifted by all indications and are probably spread out through a series of garrisons. The Ohio Valley, uh, starting in the Cincinnati area and moving uh, north-northwest, have forces deployed there. We know that these elements are also located at Fort Echuca. There are some at Fort Benning, Georgia. We know that an element was also located at Fort Drum. By the way, our processing center for detainees in the western half of the United States is Oklahoma City. We do not know what the location is for the eastern seaboard at this time. However. By all indications, Fort Drum will be the control point for processing individuals to detention facilities on the eastern half of the United States, east of the Mississippi. If there are any problems, uh, what I would recommend for a lot of people that are concerned about this is that we observe the air, not the ground. However, I will say this. In Cleveland, for instance, we have friends and patriots who have photographed UN armor tra being transported by rail from east to west. Many of the people that I've been in contact so far are both intelligence analysts or have worked as intelli intelligence analysts and counterintelligence sergeants. They are experienced in observation and they know what they're doing. Because of this, we can rely upon their first-hand information. Most of the time, though, you're seeing FinCEN forces utilizing rotary wing aircraft assets. Excuse me. Back in uh, the early part of 1990, Approximately 3,000 rotary wing aircraft were withdrawn from our strategic reserve. These are not from the reserve or guard. These came from the mothball fleet. Upon implementing this force, these units were transferred to FinCEN, painted in the flat black, not flat green, and not camouflage green. These aircraft are in flat black. They bear no markings or identification to determine whether they, are, whether they are American or foreign national. And the fact of the matter is they are now foreign national assets, no longer in the hands of the United States Air Force. We do supply and support them with your tax dollars and your tax dollars, but we do not control them completely now. FinCEN forces utilizing these rotary ring assets have both heavy lift aircraft and conventional attack aircraft. The heavy aircraft, which may have been experienced in the area where I'm speaking right now, are the Chinook CH-47. 
It has a rotor front and rear and can carry up to 64 personnel in one lift. The first mission for FinCEN helicopter and support aircraft, right, the, the first mission is to go in and actually control ground operations. They do not have to follow roads. They are not concerned with roadblocks, obstructions, uh, infrastructure damage, etc. They can drop into an area, insert military forces, utilize those military forces to the best of their ability, and if they're needed somewhere else, lift and move them again. The second mission for these aircraft, though, is very important. Because of the detention camp mechanism that exists, they do not feel that it will be safe to transfer prisoners on the ground. That's why a large preponderance of the aircraft that they've received are heavy lift aircraft, capable of moving large numbers of people at once. Because of this, the Chinook's mission will be to transfer from pickup points personnel who have been acquired and are put in temporary holding sites outside of each municipality. Here in the city where we're standing right now, somewhere in this vicinity, in, in close proximity, there is a holding area. There's also what we call a POL point, petroleum oil and lubricant point. These operations will bring the people by ground vehicle to this temporary detention site. They will never hit the ground again until they reach the detention facility itself. They will be picked up by the rotary wing aircraft, flown directly to the primary descent detention site that's closest, or to a sorting facility, where they, or it will be determined whether or not they are a high threat or a low threat. Remember, MJTF police, the, their mission is separation and categorization of men, women, and children. They will not take some individuals. It's easier just to take the whole family if you feel it's a threat. And this is their mission. Once they transfer to the sorting facility, families or individuals will be separated and then sent to primary holding areas. I guarantee that prior service military personnel, patriots, and individuals who possess firearms will not be released. That's why there are so many facilities. A good example of holding areas or detention sites that we know of that are, that are first-line pickup points, uh, Brighton Airport near Brighton, which is still a federally funded facility even though it's, it's been rented out. It originally was an Army Air Corps aviation facility. The pickup site for Ann Arbor is located due east of Ann Arbor on Liberty Road between, uh, between uh, Parker and Zeeb. We know that, for instance, the one near Jackson is located at the Jackson Airport and is pre-designated. Each metropolitan area has a pickup site that has already been predetermined. Every area. All you need to do is start to look and wheedle your way into the FEMA mechanism. And there's that evil word, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Now, we talked about this at the last meeting where I, I, <coughs> I was talking to a large group of people. And this is before the articles started to come out uh, through the federal papers about FEMA's activities throughout the United States in the 80s. FEMA is not Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA is the secret government legally. It's funded, maintained, and supported through monetary uh, expenditures designated through, uh, through the Department of Defense and also normal budgeting that's taking place every year with our government. FEMA has th approximately 3,600 employees, and yet of the 3,600 employees, only about 59 to 63 actually deal with emergency management such as storms, disasters, uh, hurricanes, or man-made catastrophes such as nuclear attack. If only 60 of them are doing this, let me ask you one very basic question. What do the other 3,600 do? Well, their mission is to manage the system after they've taken it over. They utilize black budget or black bag funding. Black bag funding are covert operation funds authorized that cannot be challenged by public agencies or entities. They've been doing this for 13 years. Remember that FEMA was created originally by Zbigniew Brzezinski. Zbigniew Brzezinski worked for Jimmy Carter. However, after Ronald Reagan came into power, Zbigniew stayed over to complete operations and deployment of FEMA inside the United States. The issue guns, drugs, drugs, guns came about approximately four years ago. The objective behind that was to create an environment, create a situation that these people could use before that, it was internal economic catastrophe. That was the mission of FEMA to create Rex 84, Rex 85. Now, the Rex series of programs start back in 1981. And originally, I participated in a program that set up a series of actions which allowed for us, for instance, to surrender 50% of Florida. 
we weren't going to stop the Russians until they got to Orlando. We used to jokingly call it the Disney line. And we weren't going to, we weren't going to make any attempt to get it back either. If you look at the globalist map, though, and if you look at the final solution through the UN Charter, we lose a good portion of the United States. This, uh, this part of the country that we're standing on right now is part of Area 62, or it could be part of Area 63. We're on the line. The way the nation is divided up, the United States of America will cease to exist. Right now, we are very close to them accomplishing what they want, very close. And I cannot emphasize that enough. With most of these actions, they have always looked at the prospect of disarming the American people first. It is the most important issue that we should concern ourselves with at this time. There's a little piece here that was given to me not too long ago, and it's the better example that I wanted. It's called bondage to bondage. And I think everybody should think about this. We all start out as slaves. At some time or another, we will revert back into slavery. At any given time, utilizing the clockwork that's depicted here, we could break this cycle. But because of the nature of man, many people refuse to. And so we will revert back into slavery. With a constitutional republic, we have the, we have the capability and the power to free ourselves now, to break the chain, break the cycle. To do so, though, we have to decide as citizens what we're going to do. We have to decide personally within ourselves. We have to, despite what most people might say about this, ask God for guidance. If we do not, as a people, ask for guidance, we will fail. It is the most important issue to concern ourselves with what is happening now. God will deal with the problems of the future. We have to deal with the temporal life that we are existing, that we are existing in at this time. And because of this, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, which were granted, those powers granted to us by God, have to be maintained by us utilizing God as our strength, as our guidepost, as our steel, as our iron rod. We have failed as a nation, or we will fail as a nation, if we do not take hold of that rod again and follow the course. There are many people in this country who will not listen to what we're talking about here. I am not worried about them. Many. These people are like the population that existed in the United States in 1775. Do not be concerned for them. They'll tag along or we'll have to ship them overseas when the time comes. I can think of many glorious socialist regimes who will be more than happy to take in a few more slaves. I don't say that we hang them or shoot them. There's a lot of people who'd like to do that. I think the best punishment is to brand their butt, give them one piece of luggage, and ship their hind end overseas where they can live out the rest of their lives outside this constitutional republic and see how we flourish from afar. Because given the opportunity, we will be, we can be, and we will be the finest nation on this planet. And with the Republic, we can go on to become an even greater power. But without the Republic and without our personal rights, we are nothing. Why, I've asked this many times, do you think that everybody on this planet wants to come here? There are many other places on this planet they could go. There are many other forms of government. We as a minority, and we will always be a minority, by the way, I think, as a minority, we are still the, the flowering example of opportunity, no matter what anybody says. Everybody would like to grasp a part of this, and we have the capability to do that, but we have to hang on to those documents which were given to us in the first place. If we do not have the Bill of Rights, the rest is moot. If we do not support the Constitution, we shall fail. These people that I'm talking about, the MJTF police, FinCEN, the UN forces that are here have no comprehension of our form of government. They come from governments alien to us. They come from governments that are a threat to this form of government, to this nation. That does not mean that they will always be our enemies. That does not mean that they're necessarily ruthless uh, aggressors that will always be ruthless aggressors. There are people that will change within their mechanism, but until they change, we cannot come halfway. Halfway means losing half the Constitution. What part are you willing to give up? What part are we willing to surrender in the, of this nation? What, what state? Which, which one of our constitutional amendments are we willing to throw, in, throw into the kitty, so to speak, so that we get a little piece of something else from the other side? And the first thing I'd have to ask is this. What can the other side offer us? Absolutely nothing. That's more important than anything else right now is to understand there can be no compromise concerning this action. Is it unacceptable that UN forces be here? Most assuredly. Is it illegal? If you will recall, we have a little thing called passe comitatus. 
Under Posse Comitatus, it is virtually illegal for military forces to be used as law enforcement agencies inside the United States. And yet right now, we have military forces in several parts of the country being used as law enforcement. Probably the best example in 1990, which we came across, and this has to do with the ski mask again. The guy with a ski mask jumps into your house. You have no idea who he is. He's wearing a black uniform and it has three letters on it. You don't know what any of those three letters stand for. When this takes place, how do you know where he came from? He comes in, they lay you on the floor, they, they virtually rape your house, they rape your privacy, they go into your bedroom, they go into your children's rooms, they destroy property, they take property for private, for private profit. When they are done, they leave. You never have any idea who they are. And then they go back to Europe, or they go back to Asia, and they spend what they've stolen. These people were training uh, ranger units as law enforcement agency forces uh, in 1990 through 91, utilizing the ski mask mechanism. In uh, Fort Hood, Texas, these forces were training with the local sheriff's department in confiscation and seizure policies. Important to remember because, again, Posse Comitatus was not overridden. Remember, the president must override Posse Comitatus, and it can only be for a very short and temporary time. Very short special situation, not a, an undeclared internal war. In addition to this, it should be remembered that uh, this type of situation existed in 1775. This is the exact same thing our forefathers experienced. A foreign military force was injected into the United States, not willingly on their part necessarily, and many of them came over to our side down the road. But this force's mission was to do exactly what these people are doing now. The first two battles of the American Revolution, it must be remembered, were fought for what? Taxes? No. Were they fought because uh, we were worried about tea? No. The order was to confiscate all shot, powder, cannon, and individuals who possessed them. The first two battles of the American Revolution were fought for the same reason that we are fighting in parts of this nation right now, the possession of coercive force. When the government possesses all of the coercive force available, you have what? A police state. Doesn't make any difference. Take your choice of colors and uniforms. If the government possesses total coercive force as a monarchy, as you know, under pharaohism, under socialism, communism, fascism, it is a police state. We fortunately had founding fathers who understood the capacity of man and his greed. And because of that, we were given the inalienable rights that were laid down. Now, they also understood that we might lose them, and there's, a, there's an interesting statement that Jefferson made. The beauty of the Second Amendment is that it would not be needed until they tried to take it. Now, that's pretty prophetic, because he understood exactly why we had the arms. It wasn't for hunting, it wasn't for fishing, it wasn't for uh, can plinking, though certainly those are ways to train. The objective was to protect us from tyranny first and foremost, more so than anything else. Tyranny can come in any color, shape, and form, it can come at any time. It knows no boundaries. If given the opportunity, it will overwhelm you and enshroud you with its power. It should be understood, to give you an example of how this works, here's tyranny in the making. The PL 100-690, there's a copy of it. PL 100-690 was the, the camel's nose which allowed the government to do most of what we are moving into now. PL 100-690 incorporated no knock search warrant, House to House Search and Seizure Clause, the money change, which everybody better be very worried about, because with the money change comes, comes control of your lives totally. It also included many other actions which are amending existing laws. This is very important because you get an and or a but in this document, put it in another document, and all of a sudden you've changed the entire meaning of a law. Through this law, the Copper Wire Act was changed. And I will give you an example. Most people think that it is illegal to wiretap without a warrant. It is not. A wiretap can be formed on anybody's household under the changes in this law at any given time, but a warrant must be acquired if you're going to wiretap and use it in court. That's why in many cases, many people have experienced problems with their phones, phone systems burning out because illicit taps can be done on a regular basis. And I will give you an example. In Washtenaw County in the state of Michigan, in Ann Arbor, there are 5,000 new wiretaps done every month. 5,000 new wiretaps done every month. All of the original wiretaps are proceeded through to the next month. Do some quick math and tell me how long it takes before you've saturated the entire county. 
Not long at all, does it? This is typical of the mechanism and the way it works, envelopment. With the electronic media and with the electronic communication systems, the way they're set up right now, our privacy can easily be invaded. And it must be understood that there are many different avenues that they're going to approach us with. Probably the best single mechanism that I could recommend for anybody, anybody who's interested in this subject, would be to use Operation Vampire Killer by Jack McClam. As a single document, bringing a novice into the picture, for 93 pages, it's a lot of reading that's worth its money. You can sit down in an evening and absorb the basic information necessary to perceive what's going on. I've said this before, and I'll say this again and again and again. Everybody I've talked to, I don't care who they are, I don't care if they're skeptical on this subject or not, you all get a bad feeling, don't you? I don't care who you talk to right now, they all have the same image. Something's wrong. It's like a carcass stinking in the desert. You can smell it before, long before you get to it. Now, it's very important to remember that the enemy has many, many resources and assets at their disposal. The best one we have here is you. They can't shut us all up. Word of mouth, voice to voice, person to person, we can do more damage, take and move the rock, and expose these creatures more effectively than any other tool we could possibly use. For they will silence me, and they will silence other people that are talking about this, but they can't get us all. What the Founding Fathers understood is what I think everybody here had better understand right now. If they have unlimited capabilities to confiscate your property, if they have unlimited capabilities to take your car, to take your money, to take your life if need be, what have you got to lose? What sense is there in worrying about the threat? You might as well fight. You have no choice. Now, do we fight on the enemy's terms? No. One thing about George Washington I liked is he fought for two years with little or nothing. And as there's an old saying, we don't have much, but what little we have, we know how to use. And that's how he fought the beginning of the revolution. This situation is going to be fought much in the same way, with limited assets and resources progressively steamrolling and building up. It, did I say it was going to be a short war? No. Do I think that it is going to be an, an inexpensive war? Absolutely not. But as somebody said before, will it be worth it? Most assuredly, it has to be. What is, the, what is the future of your children worth? For that's another thing they plan on taking from us, our children. Listen to the present president. Listen to the policies of the government right now. This is the age of the child. But the age of the child in whose hands? In your hands? In your hands? No, in their hands. Oh, and by the, remember, by the way, remember this. They are the ones with that velvet glove on the iron fist. And once again, I'll remind you, even if there's a velvet glove on it, it has a tendency to hurt, doesn't it? You can create a lot of casualties this way. That's right. There's a, another saying that came about that we've used before in instruction. It should be remembered. We're not talking about offense here, by the way. Nobody has gone out of their way to find these people. We aren't going overseas. We don't have to go outside of our own state now. We're not talking about having to defend our homes, having to defend our counties, having to defend our livelihood. An attacker must vanquish. He must crush. He must utterly destroy. A defender need only survive. Wave upon wave, maybe, but he need only survive and endure. For the defender is no place to go. I did, despite what we say about the people that are in, and I'll bring this up again, in Waco, it should be reminded of something. We may not agree with what they're doing in there, but we do know this, they're Americans. They didn't go looking for somebody else. Somebody came looking for them on private property in their own home, and they decided to defend themselves. Why didn't the government do very well? Because they are thugs. Thugs never do very well against anybody who's protecting themselves when they are tenacious and when they are willing to stand up and fight. There's another rule that I have about the situation we're gonna run into. They're gonna run out of secret police long before we run out of soldiers. I guarantee it. By the way, I'm also realistic. I think everybody is familiar with the National Rifle Association quoting that there are 70 million firearms owners in this country. I guarantee there are. But you know what? I guarantee that only one out of seven will show up. Guaranteed. However, let's do some quick math here. 
even if they had a million men at their disposal, we have 10 million combatants. How many are combat veterans? That's right. How many are soldiers? How many have fought before? And I can train an army. And there are many men who can do the same thing. And given the opportunity, there are many people who will be listening to this. I say the same thing to them. Organize at the lowest possible level. Organize as patriots in a militia. We are legally bound to that. It is our obligation. It is our duty as citizens of this country to participate in the militia as part of the militia at large. Men, women, young, old, and do not discriminate. I'll tell you what, but what we hear out of Waco, the interesting thing that fascinated me is that the person who was on the Barrett Light 50, that's a 12-shot 50 caliber semi-automatic rifle, it was a 64-year-old grandmother, and she did a fine job of cutting a lot of people in two, I'm here to tell you. If a 64-year-old grandmother can stand up to a bunch of 23-year-old jocks that can bench press 500 pounds, I got this funny feeling we'll do just fine. Mercenaries, I think we can handle them. Now, there are a lot of areas that they're going to get into here. There are a lot of things that I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to talk about, but I want to concentrate on this for just a minute because I'm, I, I briefly touched on it. The militia could be easily crushed and destroyed if we tried to build from above and create organizations here and then fill them out. That is not the way that this nation was built originally. That is not the way that this nation will be built in the future or will be protected in the future. The worst thing that these people are scared of are what we call coin operations. The citizen getting together with citizens that he knows. Notice I said people you know, citizens you know. People that you've grown up with, family members that you live with. That is how you must build up militia from below. A 10-man squad is a hell of a lot harder to find than a 600-man well, battalion, okay? Small groups can always be organized into larger groups, but not vice versa. It's much more difficult. The, only, the advantage we have is our limited resources can be put, put to their best ability in our hands. We don't have to worry about the government contractor. Our concern is getting people uniformed, armed, and equipped. The militia man was a minute man. And that's how you must gear yourself. You must, as, as the old saying goes, prepare for war if you wish for peace. That simple. To do so, cheaper is better. You want to put more bullets down range, you can't share a weapon. I've said this before. <laughs> okay, it's your turn. Go ahead and shoot. You ever tried that? Well, there's three of us and we're going to share a rifle. Oh, boy, that's my idea of fun. Because of that, get what you can afford, but buy as much as you can. The laws that are coming down the road right now are rolling at us just like a juggernaut. There is a wall of supply and demand that is going to hit us. When it comes, there won't be anything to buy. And because of that, if you don't do it now, you're going to be in trouble later. We have what we call, jokingly, the butter knife brigades, and I will mention this again. And he goes, butter knife brigades, what's that? I said, well, it's very simple. Uh, I'm going to give you a butter knife. And you're going to go out, and you're going to get a weapon. Now, if you don't come back, well, the worst that I've lost is a butter knife. But if you do come back, well, you've got an AK and we'll give the butter knife to somebody else. Now, I'd prefer not doing that, but I'm not going to waste a steak knife or a butcher knife. I'll probably be carrying that for that matter. Butter knife brigades are something that's been done in the past when it's necessary, and it'll be necessary to do it again, unfortunately. Those are for the ones that don't quite believe, but you know, will have found the Spirit of God down the road. Now... Another thing we should concern ourselves with is mobility. I'm not saying buy big trucks, mobile homes, etc. What I would recommend are vehicles. One of the reasons that we should be a tad concerned about what's going on right now with our vehicles, especially in transportation and transportability, is because a population on foot is easily controlled. Because of that, this was an article that I used before and I wanted everybody to see this. This was in a a, a monthly publication that was available, uh, I think it was February, and Uncle Sam wants your cars. And if you don't think so, you better start looking at the Environmental Protection Agency. You know our friends. They're only interested in fish and your cars. With the EPA's new guidelines, it will be possible for them to ban many of our cars outright, and they intend to do it. Now, I had to ask myself, why pre-84 cars? Gee, that's kind of strange. There are a lot of other cars out there that look pretty nasty that are not newer, a lot newer, especially in the state of Michigan. 
Consider this. A lot of pre-84 cars have a different type of electronic ignition, don't they? A lot of newer cars have a totally alien type of electronic ignition, and I think the best way to describe it is like this. In 1976, when I worked on a Ford Granada, the electronic ignition was this large. It did virtually every function on the car that was necessary. That was with 70s technology. Today, the electronic ignition on our car is this big, is this thick, and this tall, and that's with 1980s microchip technology. Now, what's in that electronic ignition? Two considerations. Number one, an EMP shutdown circuit. That'd be the best example. It would be very easy to incorporate. Uh, it would work on a specific frequency. Upon transmitting on that particular frequency, you could shut down whole categories of vehicles. Now, I'll give an example of this. The IROC Mustangs, and also I believe the comparable vehicles made by GM, have a microchip in them already that upon functioning at 140 miles an hour for seven seconds will shut down the vehicle. On some cars, we understand that it's as low as 105 miles an hour. In fact, a car was just tested. Now, because of that, you got to ask yourself, what's in your electronic ignition in your new car? If this is already in place and can be found, what is there that we don't know about? Question number two, why not something on the line of a transponder for tracking? So much easier, and we're not talking low jack here because as everybody in communications will understand, it, e it need only transmit for a short period of time or at a very low, uh, in a very low range, and your pickup equipment will do the rest and find what you want. Each one of your VIN numbers can be signatured to the electronic ignition mechanism. It's fairly simple technology. In fact, the idea goes back to 1965, 66. All this in a box under the hood that is now this big, that was this big. And again, I ask myself, why the change? We're not talking microchip. Uh, I've got calculators that were made in 1985 that will do virtually anything that science wants you to do in a package this big in the thickness of my little finger. Isn't that amazing? Because of this, you should consider other alternate forms of transportation, or you should consider override mechanisms so that you have the capability to move during these periods. Fuel will be cut off. We know that availability, availability resources will be, will be uh, cut off drastically as far as munitions, fuel, food. How about lead? What about tin? What about manufactured items such as threaded stock, nuts, bolts, and screws. What about basic items like toilet paper? Mm, burdock's not all that exciting after a few weeks, as everybody can probably imagine. And of course, we've used it in the past, but we, don't, we would try not to use it in the future, stock up on a few things. But the, uh, the weapon systems that we're dealing with, and that we're, dealing, we're fighting against, uh, we've gotten a little taste of also. The enemy's capability to utilize electronic warfare technology against us was displayed during this little Kentucky bout with the kids that were lost in the Smoky Mountains uh, International Biosphere. Oh, that's right. They didn't call it that, did they? They called it a national forest. Isn't that amazing how our national service made a point of not calling it a biosphere? In the Kentucky, uh, the Kentucky Mountains right now, that particular forest has a sign as you, enter, as you enter the area, it says International Biosphere. In all the news reports I saw, they didn't use the new proper title. They used that old American thing so that we wouldn't get people upset. Made a point of calling it a national forest, which it isn't anymore. But during that, I think it should be noted by everybody, the kids were found utilizing special technology and they were, they were picked up by very special people in black uniforms. And before they would be released, it was stated they refused to let the children go until they were debriefed. Now I gotta ask myself, why would you debrief a bunch of high school kids who were supposedly lost in the middle of the mountains? What is it that they saw that they felt the government wouldn't want other people to see or talk about? So much so that they said they wouldn't release them until they were debriefed. Interesting. What about infrared scanning technology? They're admitting to that. Uh, another example, in Waco, they admitted very briefly early in the morning on Sunday that they had used the infrared scanning technology on the compound before they went in. 
They don't want to elaborate on that, but we know that the enemy has this threat capacity, or I should say a, a government has this threat capacity. There are ways to counter this, uh, and in the future we'll discuss it. Uh, some of the simpler methods we call standoff are utilizing glass. Glass is a tremendous insulator, and with two layers of thermal glass, you'd be surprised how much protection you can offer from these devices when they're inside a building and used as shielding. Another are reflective metallic surfaces, such as uh, space blankets. Gee, what a simple compensation for a system that costs a lot of money, or it costs millions of dollars to deploy. There are other options that are available. A few reminders, when you guys dig a hole, save the topsoil. When you fill the hole in, make sure you put the topsoil back on. It's kind of obvious when you use infrared scan, it's like this, if you look at it from the sky, it's like this piece of paper on my blue coat. It's just about that obvious. There are little things that you have to remember about protecting yourself, it's called spoil. How to defend yourself in the future will be, will be a matter of how ingenious you are. And a lot of the answers are fairly simple. Their technology is very expensive. Anyway, we're back. Well, to begin with, now we're into our next hour. I'm going to discuss both uh, past activities and future proposed actions inside the United States by a variety of organizations, including the MJTF police, FinCEN, and UN battle groups that will be deployed against the American people. First of all, we'll go back to uh, early 1989, when originally in smoke-filled rooms behind closed doors, some committee of uh, political monkeys decided that it was time to go after the weapons inside the United States. In doing so, what they did is decide to come up with a program called Guns, Drugs, Drugs, Guns. If you have a gun, you must be a drug dealer. This was everybody, private firearms owners, skeet shooters, whoever. Our response as law-abiding American citizens was supposed to be, oh God! guns. I'm not a drug dealer. Oh, please. Only, unfortunately, what happened as far as the government's concerned is that the American people started to rearm themselves very quickly. We surveyed a lot of different shows throughout the United States, uh, Midwest specifically. In fact, in some cases, we covered three different cities and two different states uh, within a 10-hour period. And what we saw weren't people trying to get rid of their weapons. In fact, uh, that wasn't the case at all. You noticed that people weren't selling anything and were buying more. It was shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, uh, rear end to front, and heel to toe. And everybody was bringing every mother's uncle in to buy weapons, munitions, equipment. And we saw this from Kentucky and Tennessee, to Pennsylvania, to New Jersey, to Michigan, Indiana, Illinois. The effect that their guns, drugs, drugs, guns program had is that the Patriots, uh, the Patriots out there started to talk to people and said, see, this is what we told you was going to happen. And after surveying a few shows, I'm sure that the intelligence information coming back through the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms people, and also from other agencies that were monitoring the gun shows, that the result was not exactly what they wanted either. More ammunition and weapons passed through the FFL dealers and through firearms uh, sellers at gun shows in the three months of 1990 and in the last 15 years prior to that, all sales combined. In some cases, over a million rounds of ammunition were sold off firearms, uh, off of ammunition uh, dealers' tables. Thousands of conventional firearms, virtually hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of equipment, such as field gear, boots, uh, uniforms, medical support items. And these were all going out and disappearing. I used to be when Fred Schmidlap and Jim and myself would go over to a gun show, we'd go in and, well, let's go buy something. We'd go buy it, we'd take it home, we'd fire it up a little bit, we thought it was neat, but it was that Vogue toy for the month. We got done with it, we might take it back in, we'd sell it, and we'd go buy something else. And there was a used firearms market. Today, there is no used firearms market. There's a reason for that. Everything that is in the hands of the people is being absorbed. This is happening right now again. It's as if somebody cut an artery and the weapons are just ooh, gushing out. In fact, the, the people cannot keep up with demand enough. Now because of this, they're getting a tad concerned again. The effect of the guns, drugs, drugs, guns campaign should have been for people to just hand things over or try to dispose of the weapons because they were fearful of being prosecuted by the government. 
when in 1990 it was realized that uh, they weren't exactly going to accomplish their original mission, they had to change their timetable a little, we think. Uh, by the third month, it was realized that the militia forces, civilian arms, were, blood, were bludgeoning it at a massive proportion. The structured forces that were inside that were deployed, including a, uh, Operation Achilles, which we mentioned before, they began to reduce their actions because of notoriety and the fact that they were seeing more aggressive uh, stances on the part of the civilian population that they were attacking. Unfortunately, like cockroaches, you can spray and they keep coming back. So by late 1992, the latest Guns, Drugs, Drugs, Guns campaign escalated with a variety of other actions overlapping. Uh, it's a threat to your children. Well, not if you train your children properly. It's a threat to society. Well, this society isn't monarchical England. It isn't uh, pharaohic Egypt. And we most certainly aren't the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Because of that, we trust our people with firearms. In fact, uh, we are the government. Therefore, we're the ones who decide who should have firearms. I think everybody forgets that. We the people. We have an obligation and a responsibility. Now, during this time, uh, from late 1992 to the early part of 93, we've seen a series of other actions take place in which firearms confiscations, house to house, door to door, have taken place. Operation Clean Sweep in Chicago, Operation Achilles II in Cleveland, and a series of actions that took place after the Los Angeles riots, not against the street gangs, but against the citizens who defended their homes and their businesses. Remember the Koreans who were on top of their roofs? Strangely enough, the government used the videotapes that were made to track down these homeowners and they are now being prosecuted for using their weapons to defend themselves. And this is an ongoing program. You're not seeing this in the general media because it wouldn't exactly bode well with the rest of us. Because of this, it is realized that they're going to have to intensify and in fact have intensified their campaign. During the, uh, the earlier phases, for instance, in uh, Chicago, uh, the black helicopter missions that we were talking about in the earlier hour were taking place extensively. We have individuals who were in high rises who were actually above helicopters flying between the high rises in Chicago, in the Windy City. These uh, operations uh, culminated in a final activity which lasted approximately one week in which they cordoned off neighborhoods, went building to building and house to house, entered forcibly if necessary, and prosecuted the owners of any firearms, ammunition, or gun parts found. This was Operation Clean Sweep. In Cleveland, an activity which was covered only by national public radio, involved elements of the MJTF police and probable FinCEN forces. The Ohio Guard was mobilized from several different areas in the state transferred to an area outside the Cleveland airport where a, where a mount area, M-O-U-T, it's an urban warfare training area, was set up with three neighborhoods. The units that were brought in were trained in house-to-house -house search and seizure and securing a neighborhood. They then went into the first training neighborhood, went house-to-house, -house, secured the neighborhood, and then attacked a second neighborhood. Once they had secured the second neighborhood, they had to hold the first two and went to yet a third neighborhood. After these elements were trained and passed through this mechanism, they were transferred to uh, different parts of Cleveland where they were actually deployed against the population. This happened about the same time, the time that the Weaver incident took place in Idaho. It was almost simultaneous. In fact, a series of actions both in Cleveland and one here in Michigan took place either during or shortly after the Weaver incident. Now in Cleveland, this received media coverage. In some parts of Ohio, this received media coverage, but it received no national media attention except for one place. National Public Radio, who thought that this was the next best thing to sliced white bread, that they had violated people's homes, that they had gone into different parts of the city, and that they had done this. Now, interestingly enough, we were challenged on this, but in the last two weeks, actually, I'm sorry, three weeks, when the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms forces came into Detroit to search house to house in specific neighborhoods, it should be noted that National Public Radio, on the 11th of March, broadcast another one hour program in which they specifically mentioned that if we can do it in Cleveland, why can't we do it in Michigan? 
Now, I had to ask people when they heard this broadcast, what were they talking about? What happened in Cleveland? We knew, but nobody else did. The enemy only refers to their victories very quietly after they know that they have secured the action and they have been successful. Otherwise, no comment made. The Waco situation, which is typical of uh, a lot of what we're going to be seeing in the future, although I think you're going to see even more ham-handedness, uh, involved a 100 to 130 man assault company of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, probably under MJTF authority again. It should be understood that as of March of 1989, the alcohol ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms forces were divided up into these assault companies. Each platoon consists of 40 men armed with the M16A2 rifle, the AR-15 9mm conversion, or the M79 grenade launcher. It is now known that these forces also include the M60 machine gun, which is an infantry battle weapon now being deployed with policing agencies. You know, like they have in Russia, if you can do the goose step. It was interesting to note that this assault company in, in Texas was identical to the type of forces that were used during Operation Achilles in the Ohio Valley coming up into Michigan. The forces are in all black BDU uniform, they wear the black PASGAT armor with the black PASGAT helmet, which looks like quite a bit like the German coal scuttle. Uh, they are armed, equipped, and maintained through DOD resources. So many of the weapons that they're provided with are actually provided by our military. In many cases, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the FBI, DEA, are now receiving training both at Quantico and many of them have gone through the U.S. Army Ranger School. That's rather exotic training for people who are supposed to be police officers in the United States. On the other hand, if you again need thugs, you've got to send them someplace where they can learn to be fairly efficient thugs. Many of the people that we've had that went through Ranger School in the last one year said that up to 50% of their company were made up of Federal Bureau of Investigation people and individuals who were involved with alcohol, tobacco, and firearms or a drug enforcement agency. Now, DEA, by the way, has what we call CLEAT. C-L-E-T units. CLEAT units are directly under the control of uh, the Treasury and or can be accessed by the MJTF police or FinCEN. CLEAT are armed identically to the ATF combat elements and are deployed throughout the United States and can be used overseas. DEA is now using extensive resources from outside the United States in terms of manpower, but they will not identify what the name of the organization is that's being used. Now remember, we know what FinCEN is, but nobody else is supposed to. So it can be assumed that FinCEN is the element that's involved. How they're deploying equipment here? Well, it's kind of strange. A lot of people said, where are they? Well, they're in all parts of the United States, but we've had at least one face-to-face -face confrontation with some of their people right here in Michigan. In fact, though I can't mention names, on a given date, one of our people was attempting to use a space available flight through uh, U.S. Army uh, Tactical Lift Command. Upon arriving at the site, he gave them his military ID card. Somebody punched in his name, looked at him very briefly, and went, punched it in again. In a minute and a half, there were two MPs behind him. Now, this site, which is Sulphur International Guard Base, and I will point this out specifically because people have asked about this, the individual was then taken and put in a car, driven around to the southwest quadrant of the post. When he arrived there, the MPs took him out of the vehicle, and as he entered the structure, the first person at the table at the, entr at the entrance desk was in all black uniform with no identifiable insignia or markings at all. He was then taken to an interrogation room. Now at first he's going, oh my goodness, what did I do? My ID card must be messed up or something. But upon seeing the black uniforms, he understood exactly who he was dealing with. He was sat down, and the first thing that was asked, how many cars do you own? How much food do you have? How many weapons do you own? What are the names of your children? What does 762 by 39 millimeter mean? And he really didn't know. Well, he did, but he didn't. He thinks an inch, not in metric. And then there was a little conference, and they left the room. Well, they left the room, and they left a file sitting on the table. Anybody who's involved in the military knows that you don't do that. Your career rests on security. But it should be understood that in this file, he dragged it across the table, opens it up very quickly, and there's a big rat sheet about, oh, two and a half foot by 
foot and a half long, a foot and a half tall. On this sheet was a spider web of names, of arrest warrant, of people to be arrested. My name was at the top for the state of Michigan, so I can be proud. I'm number one and try, and I don't have to try harder. Number two was another individual that was with us. Number seven is another in, is the individual who was being questioned. All of the other lists had virtually dozens and dozens of names. It should be understood that, first of all, it was meant for him to see this, and it was a direct threat to anybody else who's prying into the affairs of these little goose steppers. Gentleman made a little rattling noise at the door and came back in, sat down, and basically told him, we have nothing to hold you on, we're going to let you go. Walked him back out, two MPs appeared, picked him up, walked him back over to the vehicle, drove him around to his vehicle, and he left the post. Now anybody who understands military documentation will understand that if you have a classified records jacket, you take a classified record sheet and put it on top, first of all. That's if you just have it laying around on your desk. The next thing you don't do is take a classified document and leave it where somebody you really don't want to see it can see it. This was meant as a direct threat. This was just before we were involved with other uh, meetings that we participated in that where we were illuminating people to this subject. If I keep this up, they're going to do something to me. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not stupid. If I'm already on the list, as many other people are, look at it this way. You're never going to come off that list, okay? Your butt's in the fire and you might as well fight and go for broke because you ain't got no place left to run. It's that simple. Now, when I worked for intelligence, I worked as an intel analyst with a TSSBI clearance. Handled a lot of classified documents. People don't operate like that unless they're sending you a message. Now, the last time I had this happen, and I will bring this up to date as far as you know, activities go, last time I had this happen was a very interesting experience because we started to look into the MJTF police and FinCEN, etc. And on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, I had a knock at the door where I work in my office. Open the door and here's campus security. And who should be with him but the area director of the FBI and one of his henchmen. And of course they wanted to talk to me. Well, let me tell you something. When the police come to visit you at 3 in the afternoon, you better understand on Friday that they plan on keeping you for the whole weekend if they can. So we sat down and we discussed quite well. He started to ask questions and the first thing he said is, uh, you've been talking with your representative and your senator. Yes, I have. Well, that's interesting. Uh, well, you know, if necessary, we, we will find somebody to put you at the scene of a crime. And they said this flat out. Uh, that's interesting. Uh-huh, okay. And so I didn't really respond effectively to that other than, well, no crime's been committed, and all we're talking about here is truth. Well, then he started asking a lot of other questions like, how do you feel about assault weapons? I said, well, well, basically, I've been telling everybody to buy everything they can get their hands on, and I'll own as many as I possibly can. Why? And, of course, it was like, hmm, what do we say to that? So they weren't, weren't really sure how to respond to this. I mean, I was being very open with them for the most part. Um, when they were done, they didn't take me away, only because I didn't think they weren't sure exactly how to figure what we, we did know that they were coming in advance, I will say that. I had a little warning. And it's not the first time, but we've had three different attempts where they've tried to stop us from doing just this, informing people. Because like bugs, they hate for you to move that stone. And I put a little piece up here. On the plains of hesitation lie the blackened bones of countless millions who at the dawn of victory sat down to rest and resting died. While most assuredly they are close, we are just as close, and they know it. They are scared snotless of the possibility of the American people waking up. Any possibility, any buddy trying to bring forward what we're talking about puts such a wrench in their plans that they can't afford to see this exist. They will do everything in their power, if need be, probably eliminate people, but I think that's down the road. Right now they're, not, they're rather concerned. We are, we're rather public. But they will do everything in their power to squash this movement in its infancy. They know they cannot afford to see this continue. We must not hesitate. On the plains of hesitation lie the blackened bones. We must forge an organization now at the lowest possible level. It's called the American citizen. We must get together as a people and build. 
If you do not build now, you will not have the capacity later to protect your family, your livelihood, your people. It's that simple. Now, activities. Uh, example, choppers uh, that we've been seeing all over the state, many people have seen them. There were a number of sightings over the weekend. In many of our allies or friends that we know that are in the northern part of the state have seen virtual waves of helicopters, not five or six. At least four nights in a row, we've seen anywhere from 34 to 50 helicopters in waves, going from horizon to horizon, not in column. In one particular evening alone, with four people standing back to back, there were so many aircraft that the four could not count them all. Where are they coming from? Well, they're bringing a lot of assets in from overseas, most assuredly, but part of it is being pre-deployed in Canada. There's a thing called mundialization, which I've talked about before with people. It's in, um, it's mentioned in several different books, one of the most recent by, uh, about George Bush, The Establishment's Man. Mundialization, it's the conversion of a city from, uh, from being an American or a Canadian city to an international city under the United Nations, under authority of the United Nations. In doing so, the city pays a tribute to Caesar, oh, I'm sorry, to the United Nations and are under the protectorate of the United Nations. In doing this, they, while they most assuredly denounce their citizenship to their nation, they still get taxes from that nation. And, that's, and the state and the city and the state make a point of still sending them those taxes, which I think is rather strange. Well, originally, we wouldn't have put a connection to this were it not for the fact that we'd had intelligence information that uh, foreign aircraft were flying out of uh, London, Ontario, or near London, Ontario. Well, I open the book and I start to look at this and it says Dundas. Dundas was mundialized. Dundas was one of the first cities mundialized in Canada. Dundas is a suburb or like adjacent to London, Ontario. They were using the air facility at London, or near London in Dundas to transfer resources and equipment into the United States from outside the United States. This is very important because they have full authority as a UN affiliate. Now, because of the amount of attention that was given to the, um, to the uh, activity in the London area, they transferred their operations to a place called Mitchell Bay. I like this, we have a state map everywhere we go. Michigan, Mount Clemens is located here. What we're looking at right now is, is Mitchell Bay is located right across Lake St. Clair on the opposite side of the lake in Canada. A facility was set up with POL points for petroleum oil lubricant support, manning support, and what the foreign forces are now doing is jumping from Mitchell Bay into the United States and then flying their missions here and then going back. They, come, they fly through Mount Clements airspace near Selfridge Air National Guard base and are not challenged. All that the traffic controller can do is count the number of aircraft and then they are allowed to fly anywhere inside Michigan airspace or Ohio airspace. They branch out from there. Now a lot of activity has taken place in the thumb and some of our people who checked out the area who live in the area, Lapeer and North, actually communicated with people in different parts of the state or in different parts of that area of the state and they actually said, oh yes, we've seen a lot of these helicopters and we've had a lot of crashes here. Has anybody seen anything in the media about crashes in the thumb? They refuse to even talk about it and we have queried the state and they will not respond. And yet they, adv they advise us that there were at least five specific air crashes. Five, count them. A helicopter is not a small thing to have land in your backyard, especially if it's in your pool or something. Um, all of this overlaps into where, what, what will they use the helicopters for again? Well, the choppers for control and command support can also be used, as we were discussing before, tracking and tracing. Tracking and tracing is very difficult unless you have something to track and trace with. If you're in your car, it could be, of course, as we discussed, the electronic ignition system with a transponder. For most of you who have been watching the media, though, what about the chip? Now, Bogreitz talked about it, and even uh, our veterinarians in Oakland County are now talking about it. In Oakland County, the, uh, the uh, Humane Society has switched over from dog tags to a microchip that is inserted in your little puppy or in your little kitty or in your dog when he's licensed, and that dog... I know.
know people who think that their animals are more important than people. So if you can have it done to Fido, or if you can have it done to my Fluffy, why can't we do it to your child? It's that simple. Now with this in mind, the microchip, which originally we were proposing with some of the different legislation and, and literature that we've seen, would be inserted underneath the skin and the hand, could also be put in the forehead. We know the biblical reference to this, don't we people? We also know that with the chip comes total submission. I'll remind everybody about a little piece of revelation that everybody should read, 13. Receiving the mark is as a divorce from Christ. You'd be better off going out and executing a few hundred people. You might be forgiven for that. But receiving the mark is a, is a divorce from Christ, period. There is no forgiveness. There's no way to get out of it. You might as well eat, drink, and be merry because you're finished. Now, in California, they've already proposed this for the animals, and it's already in motion. That's where Oakland County got the idea. And there have already been several comments about using this, for instance, for welfare mothers now, and for many other people who are under the gun, already under the fist. All the different fingers, it's like a hand, are closing and coming together. Well, they got that nice velvet glove on them, by the way, so it's, it's very desirable. You know, it's very fashionable. It's probably quite chic. But in reality, with all of these fingers closing, fewer and fewer people will slip between those fingers. And as it finally clenches tight, there will be no escape if you are not prepared in advance. You must be prepared with all, in all aspects. Now, one thing that was mentioned about this thing with a chip is CNN had a piece on about Canada where they've already proposed this for all of the exotic animals. It is a must. It is not an option. It is mandatory. Uh, there's a lot of people who pay a lot of money for animals. There's a lot of people, as I said before, who think that the animals are more important than kids. And since you did it to my fluffy, I'm going to do it to your child. In fact, it's proposed that it be done from cradle to grave. As soon as that child is born, we got him on the table there. Mommy can't do much about it. And away we go. And the kid's grabbed right there. Now, I will say this, and this is something that was challenged before by people. If it is forced upon you, if it is ultimately forced upon you, it is not the same. And it can be done away with. It can be gotten rid of also. But to willingly, knowingly accept this action is the worst possible thing that you could do as a Christian. I can't, well, there perhaps are one or two others, but I'd have to see the laundry list. I can't think of any worse than going over to the other side and sticking with them. There are no deals to be made. There, is no, there are no options here. Now, what value will this have? Well, let's give you an example. In the America of the future, 1994 style, or is that 84? I keep forgetting. The books are so much the same. In 1994, 95, what you're going to see is a variation on this little image right here we're putting on the screen. This is not something made by an author such as, uh, say, a conspiracy theorist or uh, somebody who just picked a map up and threw some new lines in. This document was in the Detroit Free Press this last fall. It depicts the proposed borderlines for America. I'm going to ask you something once you take a close look at this. You'll notice they gave it some warm, fuzzy names, and they made it seem real fluffy, and oh, we'll just change the borders a little. But this is very important when you consider control of population groups. I might remind you of something about this article if you, if you read it, and if you didn't, I'll point it out, that uh, originally this document was done by a State Department official. This was designed to test the water to make everybody, you know, see how they'd feel about this warm, fuzzy attitude about throwing the country away. This is only an intermediate guideline. Once this is finished, the next step is to go to the finalized version, which is in the United Nations Charter, which cuts the United States into four pieces. We lose all of our external territories, and we become a totally subservient nation to the United Nations. Very important to understand. This is the first step. Remember that old term, divide and conquer. Now, I want to make note, if you put the regional map up there, you'll understand where you saw these lines before. Now, when we've tried to demonstrate to people in the past that this is where they're going, somebody said, well, I've never seen anything like that. Almost as quickly as we discussed the, this with people, this uh, article that was in the Free Press showed up. It's probably the best single example, and it's an example of many of the damning pieces of evidence that the enemy will put forward in their attempt to legitimize themselves. It's very important that they do that. 
Now, the chip, of course, allows you to control people for movement. Movement uh, is a very dangerous thing when you're free. Uh, boy, you can't really keep track of what people are doing. You can't tax them and uh, tax them out of their socks. Uh, you're not going to be able to uh, tax them in their food and their drink, tax them in their livelihood. Uh, we'll paraphrase one of our founding fathers on that. Remember? Taxation. We went to war for 10%. What are we at now? A lot more than 10%. But in addition to that, uh, movement. Uh, I'm from Area 5. I've got a chip rated for Area 5 blue code. What am I doing in Area 10? In fact, your internal papers don't show that you should even be here. Uh, I might mention, too, that there's a reason you shouldn't be there. You're property of the state. The Governor's Conference of 1989 and the Governor's Conference of 1990, which we do have on videotape, by the way, get a chance, someday we should be incorporating this in one of our, spe uh, one of our talks. They specifically stated at the Governor's Conference, all 50 members who were there and representatives of the districts said that we are nothing more than chattel. We are the property and an asset of the state. Property and asset shouldn't be allowed to just wander off. You know, after all, you might want to sell them to somebody. Oh, that's slavery again, though. That's right. We aren't supposed to think that way. Uh, it's that new world order kind of stuff. By the way, that's the salute, too. I hope you've seen this on CNN. It was on at least twice. United Nations salute. We like to joke, Mars. But it's true. They had to come up with a compromise, and that's it. Now with this, with this, uh, with the chip and control of movement, we've got to get you on your feet. We can't have you driving your cars. We've got a lot of environmental problems, so we can drive you out of your seats real quick with that. In addition to that, to control freedom of movement, we've got to take care of this money problem. I mean, you people just spend it on the craziest kinds of things, firearms and ammunition and why well, stuff that you'll just use on us, if we're the government, of course. Because of that, we have to bring another finger in, money. And to control the money, we have to change it. In the first phase, if anybody has a sampling of it in their wallet, and they probably do, any of your 1990 series currency, if you will look, and you can hold it up to the light, face the currency like this, Turn it up on end, look under the numbers with the light, you'll see a bar line inside the paper. This is a platinum polyester microscreen barcoded element. As we were talking about traceability with your car and with your person, this currency was being tested and is being tested now for traceability on your person, in your home, in your business, everywhere. This is what we started to call the intermediate currency because this is not the final currency. The final currency is called the blue chip dollar. The blue chip dollar is virtually blue. The one dollar bill will be blue, all the others are of different colors. By what we understand, there is also a barcoding just above the twenty dollar that is printed out here. This can be scanned two different ways. If you look around the oval of the currency, you will find that there are micro printings which repeat 20, 20, uh, 20 US, 20 US, 20 US, 20 US. But it apparently, in, a, in the latest piece that we've seen, this may also be screened. So there are several different ways that they can actually screen this. With 1983 technology, it was possible for them to drive by your home and from the road screen your house and identify by the dollar amount how much cash you have in your house. This is 1983 technology. The year is 1993. If our computers have expanded geometrically in capacity, I want to ask you another question. What do you think they've done with the technology concerning this? And where are they now? See what I mean? By the way, PL 100-690 covers this. And if you get a chance, you need to, what you need to do is call your senator or your, call your congressman. Yes, bet. Let's do it this way. Call your congressman. Request a copy of Peel 100-690. It is a book, three quarters of an inch thick, seven by ten format. In it, you will find all of this. And originally, people said, well, I read the law and it said it only can do hundreds and fifties. I said, bull doo doo. The way the law was written at the discretion of the treasurer, they have the capacity to do it on all currency, and they will because there were Senate hearings concerning this. C-SPAN covered this. And during those hearings, they stated uncategorically, all of the currency will be traceable. No currency will be hidden by the time they're done. And this is intermediate. 
this currency will be devalued down the road. The exchange ratio will probably be six to one. At a six to one exchange ratio, your debts don't change, but your money does. So let me ask you this, can you pay for food, heating, and the house at the same time? Like the Great Depression or Germany with its hyperinflation, you get to choose between heating and eating. Which are you gonna do if you have four kids? Hmm, now it becomes a challenge, doesn't it? On the other hand, if you buy tangible products with this worthless piece of paper developed by the, by the uh, Federal Reserve, not by us, remember this is just a Federal Reserve note, this isn't really money, use this to, your, to the greatest possible level that you can, taking advantage of volume purchasing by getting together with those friends that you organized in the militia. You put away munitions, food, and equipment with this before it becomes valueless. During the transition phase, you should have coin instead of paper. Why? During a devaluation, in fact, during this devaluation, in PIL 100-690, it makes no allowance for the coin change. Coin will still have a face-to-face -face value. In Israel in 1973, when they changed the currency, people who had coin ate the next week. People who had paper were sucking air. It should be understood that you want to put a percentage of coin in quarters, dimes, even nickels if necessary, whatever you can afford. Half dollars and full dollars are the best way to go. Now, it should be interesting to note that for those of you who are trying to financially protect yourself, does anybody know about the confiscation laws? Well, we're going to get into them now. The other finger is starting to close. This one. Now, with the existing confiscation laws and with the banking laws in PL 100-690, any instrument, cash, money order, or cashier's checks, or any other negotiable instrument that can be transferred into a bank or used by a bank is to be kept track of by the bank against you. And it's at the discretion of the teller and the bank as to and whether or not they consider it a criminal activity. Now, the limit at this time is $10,000. $10, it may have changed. We don't know. It could be lower. Under the original law, they have the authority to go down to every $150 transaction. At their discretion, they inform an agency of the government, and that agency then can then impound and confiscate your money. Okay. If they do this, or if they decide that you've done something that we call structuring, in other words, I decide I don't have $10,000 at a time that I spend, okay? So over a 12-month period, I do $2,000 here, $3,000, $2,000 again, and I'll spend another $4,000 in, in negotiable funds and put it in and use it in another way. If I do that, that's interpreted as structuring and at their, at their discretion, what we call arbitrary enforcement. Anybody in law enforcement understands what this means under civil law. Under common law, you cannot have arbitrary enforcement. Under civil law, you can. But under civil law and with arbitrary enforcement, they can take this property from you and they don't have to give it back because you have to prove that you're guilty. You know what that is? That's British law, kids. That's where you have to prove your innocence. That is not the U.S. Constitution. That is not our Bill of Rights. Guilty until proven innocent are those little dictator things again, the little goose-stepping guys, you know, they do this, okay? What we have to watch out for is you have to be very, very careful. I would not use, not that I would ever break the law, but I wouldn't be using very many of these bills, and I wouldn't keep very many of these bills, and I get rid of them as quickly as I can. When they change, you, during the transition period, you will have about six weeks to turn this money in for the new currency. In that six-week period, for the first time in American history, the old currency will be worthless. That's the policy of banana republics, not a constitutional republic that is sound using sound currency. It is interesting to note, again, this is a Federal Reserve note, not a U.S. dollar, not a gold dollar or a silver dollar or silver currency. How will they use this against us? Well, eventually, once they get to the new currency, then we get that mark thing incorporated. Now, I don't know if anybody's been watching our new uh, socialized medicine program, I mean a restructured uh, medical program, but under this new socialized uh, structured medical program that we're going to have, 
it's important to note that they're already talking about using your social security number to determine whether or not you get service, tying all of them together and bring them all into one number. Very important to understand. Now, how do they all bond together? What do we do? First of all, protect yourself, food. You know, there's one funny thing about food in a can. I haven't seen anybody killed with a frozen bag of peas yet, have you? And yet, under new federal guidelines and federal statutes and under state law, it is a felony to store more than six months food supply in your home. Under new federal guidelines and new federal laws, it is called the hoarding law. It's Appeal 102 series law. We've got, we, I don't have the number here with me, I'm sorry. But it is a 102 series law which makes it a felony to hoard food. It might be noted also, though, that there's no definition of hoarding. Are three days food, uh, three, three days worth of food, uh, uh, three days worth of food hoarding is a week, is a month, 10 months, eight months? Talk to me, I need to know, I don't have any definition here. That's where this whole thing of, about arbitrary enforcement comes in. Remember that, you can be punished for having food now. Food, some silver, perhaps. Silver may not be as important as tangible items, but silver's good to have, you and I can understand it. Gold's a little harder because such a small amount of gold is worth so much. But tangible assets such as silver, we can understand, we can hold, okay? Weapons, and I argue this again and again and again, you cannot share weapons. Fine wood and steel, as we talked about before, implements that will last and can be handed down generation to generation, father to son, son to grandson. I own weapons that were made in 1891 and are as accurate and are as capable as they were when they were made. That is over a hundred years old. It is a matter of how they're maintained. Valuable are the manufactured items that we will not be able to purchase in the future. Bring all of these things together. Create a defense for your family and for yourselves and for your friends. Resources of all types concerning tools. Anybody who's a man who's worked with his hands will know what, what a good tool is worth. The value of that tool, again, can be passed down from generation to generation, and they hate that. It gets all over their bullets and everything, you know. What are they going to do? I mean, they, we are going to, if we do not accept the mark, we are going to have to take care of ourselves. They hate that thought of independence. They, they are terrorized by the thought that we as free people will stand up, and we are going to have to do that. We're going to have to take care of manufacturing for ourselves. We're going to have to take care of food production for ourselves. We're going to have to take care of ammunition, weapons requirements, reloading, something I talked about before. If you're not into reloading yet, get into reloading now. Down the road here, ammunition is going to be few and far between. Handgun Control Incorporated said two and three years ago, I have Sarah Brady on tape right here in Michigan. She said two things that everybody should remember. Number one, well, when we want to get the weapons, we're going to get your ammunition first. And the next thing she said is, First, we're going to get these weapons, but of course, our ultimate goal is to get everything. Her own words, and what are they proposing now? By the way, I don't know if you've read Bill Clinton's and Al Gore's latest book, but if you haven't, you should. In four different chapters, and I read this all last night, trust me, it was written to a sixth grade level, unfortunately, and it was done in big block print, which I'm amazed, considering we're, you know, our people are supposedly better educated than they were 100 years ago. What's fascinating is their solution to every problem at the end of every chapter, and I'll give you an example, children. Their solution, the last two paragraphs, are to pass the Brady Bill and to ban all assault weapons because they have no legitimate hunting purpose. Crime in America, what do you guess the last two paragraphs are? The exact same two I saw in that paragraph in the, in the chapter before. Now don't you think this is strange that they feel I'm so stupid they have to repeat it to me twice? Well, that wouldn't be so bad, but it's four different places, and it's, it's in four different chapters in the book, and it's virtually printed identi identically, one chapter after another. When you're trying to drive something into people's brains or brainwash them, you repeat something over and over and over again, and you convince them that this is how it should be, and you make them mimic what you've said. You don't want free-thinking, free-willed people. That's simple. Your enemy is using tools he's always used before. Data, information, technical information. One thing that has happened, I've seen this happen time and time again. You must have the written knowledge where people can access it. 
you as a mentor, you have to become an educator, a student, a person, or you have to become a mentor and an educator for a student. Teach them what to do and how to do it. To do that, you've got to have the technical data on hand. If you have a group of 10 people, you must have 10 copies of that knowledge. Reloading, combat skills, farming, I don't care, whatever subject it is, disperse your knowledge. The printed word is going to be banned. Mark my word on this, I guarantee it. It's already happened with certain books concerning how to take care of and maintain firearms. You will see it again. What can we do now? What are we supposed to do now? The thrust has to be deep into the vitals of the enemy. In order to do what we need to do at our end what, as, in, as, as citizens, one of the things I can recommend are, are to throw up stumbling blocks for the enemy. We've proposed, and we hope that it is in motion now, and we, we believe it is, that at the state level, we get involved with uh, trying to reintroduce, for instance, our state borders into the Constitution. Our state borders aren't, aren't formulated. They are not in the Constitution now. Why? Because these people have planned to restructure the government. To do that, they have to change the state. This is simple. We're going to find out who our enemies are real quick. Well, the people who vote for this are citizens, are Americans. The people who don't vote for this obviously have another agenda, and we need to know who those people are. Can we win? Absolutely. Will we win? It will be a long, drawn out, rotten, nasty affair. I would prefer not to see at all. But if we have a choice between freedom and slavery, I would rather gladly die standing on my feet with a weapon in my hand than to die in a ditch on my knees begging that somebody won't put a bullet in the back of my head. I do not plan on giving that legacy and leaving that to my children. And none of you should accept that either. Together, we must travel into the future with all of our people intact, with all of our freedoms intact. Without that, without our Constitution, without our Bill of Rights, we're in a pretty sorry position as far as what we are going to hand down to the next generation. God bless the United States. Death to the New World Order. The Republic shall prevail. Goodbye.